We are live. I knew it was going to do that. Oh, no. It was an accident, but not the kind you might think. <laughs> are we ready? <laughs> <laughs> That's As I start. pour water all across <laughs> me. Welcome to the Riley Saker Show tonight at the Poison <laughs> Pen, and thank you for joining us, streaming audience. So it's wonderful to see you. As I mentioned earlier, I think you've at least doubled your I, audience I from last time. Oh, so, yes. This is awesome. It is. It's wonderful. So... I'm Barbara Peters, and for those of you who don't know, um, I founded the Poison Pen 33 and a half years ago, and this is our third store, but we've always been here in downtown Scottsdale. So for those of you who haven't been in before, I hope you'll sign up for our newsletter and come back and see us, and um, we'll be delighted. So, Riley, you were here last year. Last Why don't we start out talking for just a moment about your book last year? Because there were some interesting things. In. Can we assume that almost everybody read last year's book? Just, yeah, show of... Well, so, I, I warned you all that it was banana pants. And I think some of you didn't quite get that warning. Because, yeah, I've, I've seen some things. On social media. But, you know, it, I I love the book. I'm crazy about the book. It's not everyone's favorite, as I've learned. But, you know, you got to try new things, and you got to step outside your box sometimes. And it was really fun to write, so there was, there's that. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it was a, yeah, it was a really weird book that we couldn't really talk about. No, um, and we're going to have a lot of trouble talking about this book tonight because nearly anything we can say is going to be a spoiler. But I did, I did ask Riley while we were chatting in the back, um, what, who he thinks his readers are? Who are you all? And I'm going to let Riley answer that. I said there are a lot of Taylor Swift fans. <laughs> A, a, a lot of horror movie lovers and a lot of people who like strong female characters. And did I, did I miss anything? Well, I, I think you indicated that probably more women than guys, but yes. not necessarily the case. I mean, we do a, a great variety of authors, and we've had, for example, any of you watch The Terminalist and Jack Carr? We did his double book launch here, and there were maybe eight women. Um, you know, so it really varies according um, a lot, and I love it when we get when we get a mix. Um, but I, I love seeing new people come into the store because after COVID, I mean, you know, rebuilding an audience and getting you all to come back has really been a challenge. Um, so thank you, Riley, for bringing in all these wonderful people. No, thank you for having me. And thank you all for coming. This is, this is really insane. Like, this is a lot of people. So thank you. This is awesome. Right. So Riley's books are described, this book anyway, is described as a neo-Gothic I don't know if that means anything to any of you, but um, I did say about four years ago, because people are always asking me, what's the next big thing? They think somehow booksellers are magically tuned into the universe. And I did say I thought that there would be a gothic revival as kind of a natural outgrowth of Gone Girl and psychological suspense. You have to keep, you know, moving forward. And once we got into the idea that women could be uh, unreliable narrators, that women could do bad things, um, that women had agency and so forth, then the Gothic can kind of come back into play. And it's one of the oldest forms. It goes all the way back to the 18th century. But what is it that you think? Because it's a word now that's being used sort of indiscriminately. What do you think a Gothic is? I think Gothic usually involves a young, innocent woman going somewhere, usually a large estate. It could be a castle. It could be a mansion. Um, there might be some supernatural stuff happening, but not necessarily. Um, there are a lot of, like, there are a lot of gothic tropes that I tried to use in this book, and one of them is the mansion on this windswept cliff. The crumbling. The crumbling mansion yes. on the windswept <laughs> Um And just... A sinister housekeeper. Like I was thinking, who's familiar with Rebecca? Like Mrs. Danvers. Like there's a very Mrs. Danvers-like character in this. Um, there's always a sexy groundskeeper. There's a sexy groundskeeper in this. Um, and so like I just, 
it's just kind of like this cool mood that's kind of old fashioned and has the potential for it's just more fun than I think like slasher or like current yeah psychological suspense like I wanted to go a little bit old school and go gothic like I remember growing up and I wish I could remember like the book and the title and the author but my mom was reading this book and the cover was like this it was one of those great like 70s covers like the illustrations were so cool and where like it's supposed to take place in the 1800s but they all look like it's 1977 with like the hair <laughs> and so it was one of those and like it was like this mansion in a background and there were like gnarled trees and i swear they're probably bats but maybe that was just my imagination and in the foreground this woman in this flowing white gown like fleeing the mansion and i don't know what it was called i don't know what the heck it was about but boy that captured my imagination as a kid i was just like where what is she running from where is this house and it just it just conjured up all this thing in my imagination and so that's kind of like a similar tone I was going for with the only one left. Right. So isolation is a really key part. You have to put somebody in a in jeopardy in a place where, you know, the normal normal rescue mechanisms are not going to happen. Um, landscape is really important and usually it involves, as you say, a castle, a crumbling mansion, the fall of the House of Usher, if any of you, I don't know if any of you have actually ever read Edgar Allan Poe and the Fall of the House of Usher, but, you know, that's a great example. Rebecca's a great example. Manderley, the Cornish Mansion, you know. And so isolation and um, and a not just remote, I should say, but, but then the characters need to be isolated within whatever this context is, the house or whatever it is. Yes, and in the only one left, it's... Um, Lenora Hope, and she has such a, you know, to use a Taylor Swift, she has a reputation, y'all. Um, <laughs> like, um, she, when she was 17, everyone thinks that she murdered her entire family one night, and um, they didn't have the proof. Um, they couldn't pin anything on her, but everyone generally thinks, and it's it was very, very vaguely loosely inspired by Lizzie Borden, of course. I mean, you actually stole it from the Lizzie Borden story. <laughs> <laughs> Steal is a very mm, strong word. Nonetheless. No, it, no it, it was, it, it really became like, I was thinking about Lizzie Borden, and I don't know why. Like, I think I might have seen an episode of Mysteries at the Museum or something, and it was just like sort of rattling in the back of my head. But I was thinking about Lizzie Borden, but not necessarily her. I was thinking about, okay, the scenario in which Lizzie Borden grew to be a ripe old age and needed someone to care for her. Who is that person? How did she get the job? Like, who, who gets the job? Lizzie Borden's nurse. And does she fear her? Does she suspect her? Like, all of these things. Like, she's basically tasked with keeping alive this woman everyone thinks killed her parents and so that struck me as like a very interesting character to explore and a very cool situation to explore and so i thought okay yeah i could do something along the lines of lizzie borden's nurse and then make it really gothic so let's add the mansion and the windswept cliff and the sister housekeeper and the sister groundskeeper and like manderley and the house of usher were like the two touchstones when i was creating Hope's End is the name of this mansion in the book. Yeah, well, while you're doing that, I mean, everybody always wants to know about the writer's process, so here's a good moment to ask. What, it, was it the Lizzie Borden that touched you off, but then how did you start accruing these other ideas? I mean, are you wandering around walking a dog, or are you lying on the sofa, or, you know, what is it you're doing when these other things begin to form and stick? Uh, well, the, the, one of the early just thoughts I had, and it was more of like an image really, was of this young woman in a very old timey formal nurse's uniform in like a crooked hallway. And I was like, that's a very gothic image. That's a very cool thing. And so that got me thinking about, okay, why is she wearing this old timey nurse's outfit? And it's because the staff at Hope's End are forced to wear very formal, very old fashioned uniforms for reasons known only to the sinister housekeeper. 
And so why is the, like, why is it tilted? And so I got the idea of like, okay, the mansion is on a cliff and the waves just keep crashing against the cliff. And so it's eroding the cliff. And so the cliff is slowly tilting. And so the house is leaning with it. And that was the key right there. Thinking right. of like, okay, they are in this tilted mansion. What fun can I have with that? And so like when Kit, the, the caregiver, goes to sleep, when she wakes up in the morning, the mattress is slid just a couple inches lower on the bed because of the tilt of the house. And that was something I got from 4-H camp when I was 10. I tr Yeah, I, I spent one week at 4-H camp, the only time I ever did any kind of camp. And we were in cots in these tents and like my tent was on like just the littlest bit of an incline. And so in the morning, I'd wake up and the mattress on my cot would just be like sort of bunched up a little bit at my feet. And it was really, really annoying. But it did provide me with like, I stored that away mentally. I'm like, I mean, I didn't intend to be a writer at age 10, but just that was something I kept with me in my head. And so when it came time to be like, oh, I'm going to have a tilted mansion. The first thing I thought of was like, and the bed, the mattress is going to be slid at the bottom. Thank you, 4-H Camp. The only good thing that you provided for me. Right. So this is how this is how novels form. Is you get an idea, and then you get another idea, and it sticks, and then you get another idea, and it sticks. Now, what Riley was describing there is something very important to thrillers, and it occurs in most of them, which is he sets up a ticking clock. So one of the questions is, will the action of this story finish before the house falls into the sea, if it does? because you don't know for sure. But it is an interesting ticking clock that you set going there. Yeah, it really was. And it was really fun to write. Like, I, it was a blast just to have, like, describing, like, you know, people reaching the second floor of this thing, and that's where you can really start to feel the tilt and, like, just have characters be like, whoa. And it just, it was, it's, it's really fun. And it just, I think it, like, is very visual. So, right. yeah, that was, it was a lot... I love the house in this. I think you guys will too. Like it's a really, really cool place. It is very cool. So to make this story work, um, it can't be contemporary. For example, if you think about it today with modern forensics, we would be pretty sure whether Lizzie Borden actually killed her parents or not, right? There'd be blood splatter. There'd be DNA evidence. There'd be, you know, probably cameras, uh, whatever it is. <laughs> so you couldn't really get away with it. So... The backstory takes place when in this book? The, the, the main plot is 1983. The Hope Family Massacre, as it's known, was 1929. Right. And I, I chose both of those dates for a reason. Um, 1983, this is one of those books where, like, access to Google would destroy the plot. So, like, you would have, like, it would be five pages long. <laughs> and my, my publisher kind of wanted more than that. So um, I did 1983, and also it's one of those times where we, we met, those of us, I was of a certain age in 1983, so like those of us who were around like remember 1983. Those of you who weren't still know, have a general idea of what it was like. It's, it's not like too far out there where it's like, what's going on here? But it's also far enough away technologically wise that it's a whole other world now. So like there were still rotary phones and things like that. And so even more so hopes end because the murders took place in 1929. I wanted a time that felt very far away, even like from 1983, like, Oh my gosh, it was so long ago, but it really wasn't. It was 54 years. And so a lot of the key players from that time were still around. And so it had sort of the same thing where 1929 and 1983, it feels like, oh, it's eons ago when it really necessarily wasn't. And also, I liked the idea of having Hope's End to be a place where both of these time periods sort of collide. Not a lot has changed in that mansion since the night of the murders. And so it feels like a place where time has stopped or like time doesn't exist. So it could be 
any year. And it just is another thing, like including the, the tilt of the house that makes everything a little bit strange for Kit, the main character who takes has to take care of Lenora. Well, 1929 was a really seminal year. You know, it was the year that the market crashed and the depression started, and people who had the kind of money that allowed them to build houses like that, like in Newport, Rhode Island, many of them lost their money. It takes a lot of money to keep up an old house like that. So, you know, and have a staff and all the rest of it. So there are a lot of interesting things in play there. Yeah, and that the, 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 the crash does come into play because that was... That's another thing. Like the night of the Mer the Hope Family Massacre was the day of the market crash. And because I wanted it to be not, I didn't want the murders to be like so famous. Like I didn't want to be as famous as Lizzie Borden. We all know who Lizzie Borden is. I wanted Lenora Hope to be more of a localized thing, almost like an urban legend. Because I think, again, if she was too famous, it would alter the plot a little bit like kit would know more along the lines of what she was getting into where in this case she knows the name lenore hope she knows the creepy rhyme about lenore hope because there has to be a creepy rhyme i mean and so she's it's she thinks she knows what she's getting into but she doesn't and the rhyme by the way was the very first thing i wrote like before i quite knew what the plot was going to be i just figured okay there has to be a creepy rhyme and one afternoon I just sat down and just cobbled something together. And that's honestly how Lenora Hope got her name because I needed a word that rhymed with rope. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's, yeah. So why don't you, since you're showing off your poetry chops here, why don't you recite the I rhyme? I can recite it. Yeah, it's okay. <clears throat> At 17, Lenora Hope hung her sister with the rope stabbed her father with a knife, took her mother's happy life. It wasn't me, Lenora said, but she's the only one not dead. Ooh, and there's the title. That, that was that was one of the, um, I, for the title, like we didn't know what to call this thing. I wanted to call it Lenora Hope. And that, that is not my book, yeah. That's... <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't have any books to put up here until Jacob gets back. This is the book we're going to give away at the end of the program. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering if it's totally random, it's not. But this book's pretty too. No, but we we I wanted to call it Lenora Hope, and my publisher was like, I don't know if that's marketable, and I was like, How dare you? But they're totally right. That was not marketable, and so we like. Like in house, we're like, what should we call this thing? And someone was like, the only one not dead. And it's like, that's not, no, yeah. It, it. And so, like, we're like, the only one left? Okay, that works. But so, yeah, it's, I, it was a lot of fun coming up with that rhyme. And I, it really didn't change since like that first afternoon. Like, this is the rhyme. And then I kind of built the book around it. Are we going to expect more poetry in your future work? Oh, gosh, no. I'm not. A, <laughs> that's that's as poetic as I get, I think. Yeah. So the rhyme introduces an element we haven't yet discussed about the sister, right? Hung the sister with a rope. So um, we've mentioned the parents, but talk about the sister. Yes. Um, this is really a story about sisters because we should we should talk about the whole typing thing because Lenora... And, and she's had a lot of ill health. So Lenora, she can't speak. She can't walk. All she can really do is move her left hand. And she can communicate by like tapping. I think it's like, you know, like, I forget. It's been so long since I wrote this book. Like two for no or one for yes. I It's one of those. But then also like, she can use a typewriter so she can like type out words on the typewriter and so kit's first night there lenora types i want to tell you everything which is strange because lenora has never spoken about those murders ever and so kit's like heck yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll help you type up like the story of that night and so it, it 
becomes kind of a, a book within a book where there are typewritten chapters of Lenora telling her story about her sister and her parents and the events leading up to the night mm -hmm. of the murders. Oh, oh sorry about that. Um, <laughs> it's a, the book that we just put away was a book for whom I did an event this afternoon at four o'clock and I brought in the book to give it away to somebody in this audience. Right. For the putters. Right. Sorry. Um, Right, so the typewriter thing, which is kind of interesting. It's better than a Ouija board, right? Because that, that's what shows up a lot of times. Oh, there's because, one of those two. But, yeah. Well, there's... okay, but, but partly, I mean, Lenora's still alive, so it doesn't have to have a supernatural context here. She's right there and is able, um, despite her physical deficiencies, her mind appears to be in good shape. Yes, and it was it was very interesting because... I, I always knew that Lenora was not going to be able to do very much. Like I wanted her to be kind of a, a, a blank slate that people projected their own fears and thoughts onto. And so I liked the image of this woman just sitting in a wheelchair, still and silent, looking out the window, seeming like it, there's something innocent and harmless about that. And also something really exceptionally creepy about that. And I wanted to lean into that, but something I discovered very early on in the writing process is when you have like two main characters and one of them can't speak or move or do much except look out the window, how do you make this character compelling? And I was originally going to do narration, like, oh, I will have Lenora's thoughts narrating half of this book. And that just seemed like, I don't know, I think it'd be more fun if she could tell her own story in a way that Kit could also see the story. And so that's where I got the idea for the typing. And then that's when the book accidentally became like a book within a book, which after Home Before Dark, I swore I was never gonna do again. And lo and behold, it's like, oh, yep, I wrote another book within a book. <laughs> Oops. But it was really fun to explore like Lenora's, and that's where her personality comes through. Like Lenora is, mm -hmm funny and sarcastic and really kind of domineering. She's a very fascinating character and it's all like contained within like this silent motionless person and only comes out on the page that comes out of the typewriter. And that was very interesting to me. Sure it was. That's a great voice. Could I borrow your book? Thank you. <laughs> I should have thought of this sooner. Sorry. All right. Now we're back in business here. We'll return it to you. I promise. There we go. So we haven't talked about Kit. We've only sort of mentioned her name, but Kit is actually the person who enters this closed scene and begins to affect some sort of change. Kind yes. of like Mrs. DeWinter arriving at Manderley, and it all goes from there. Yeah, Kit is, Kit is definitely the... Uh, reader surrogate here she's like coming into the situation she has her own baggage because it wouldn't be a riley sager book without a main character with some baggage and <laughs> it's um she is navigating this very strange world in this strange place and she is sort of like the guide for the reader like they're experiencing just alongside with her and it's a it was interesting to write this weird, tricky mix of emotions she has for Lenora because she thinks like, okay, this is a very harmless woman. Yet at the same time, she murdered her family. So should I be frightened of this harmless woman? And then at the same time, I'm kind of feeling sorry for this harmless woman. And then she hears her story and then she starts to like, be sympathetic to her and actually like her. And then her feelings toward Lenora are always, always shifting in a way that I think the reader's feelings toward Lenora will always be shifting as well. Like I think like Kit, you will love her and you will hate her and you will suspect her and you will like feel for her. And so it was very interesting and a, a bit of a challenge to write this character who has all these like dynamic reactions from another main character and that 
So Kit is really the audience, the reader here. Right. And Kit actually needs a job. So, you know, she goes there. She's not going there, you know, as a charitable worker. She's going there as as an employee. Yes. With, I mean, with some ambivalence about whether this is a job that she should take. But she's in a lot of dead ends. And, you know, why not? Yeah. The Kit's, Kit's backstory has sort of led her to this point. Right. And she would not other... If she had any other choice, she would not be caring for Lenora Hope. She'd be caring for someone else, anyone else. Well, there we go. That's probably pretty much all we can say um, about this <laughs> yeah. book. Now, there, I mean, there there, there's some other really interesting questions. If any of you, as I threw out there, have ever read Anna Quinlan, some of you may relate to an Anna Quinlan book as part of the story here. Now you're looking at me going, what? But yeah, it's true. I, I, I read... I, I'll, I'll tell you later because it's a clue. <laughs> no, but I mean, there there are some really, you know, this is fun and it's, it's you know, an enjoyable read and all, but there are some actual serious ethical questions in, in the book. Um, and, you, all, you know, as a reader, ask yourself, what would you do? Supposing you were in this small town and you, you know, didn't have any employment opportunities and your family wasn't particularly supportive and you had a chance to take a position that might, you know, what would you choose? Would you, you know, be brave enough to go and care for Lenora? Or would you, you know, catch the next train to New York? What would you do? Um, you know, there are questions, I think, um, that a reader can put themselves in the position of at least a couple of characters in the book and ask whether they would make the same choices. Yeah, there, there's, there are reasons why Kit is there and there are reasons why Kit stays. And not all of it has to do with just wanting to learn all of Lenora's story. That's. Yep. So now that you've <laughs> upped your game, now that you've upped your game again, um, is it more challenging? I mean, every time you write one of these books, do you feel like, you know, there's a higher expectation level from your readers, not to mention your publisher, that, um, you know, you're going to have to top it in some way? Or do you, can you just go sideways and do something different? I, that's a very good question. I, I don't feel like pressure from my publisher at all. I do put a lot of pressure on myself and some books are easier than others. Um, like the house across the lake was very easy and very fun because I knew that it was going to go to some very crazy places. And once I settled on that, I just was like, okay, I don't need to worry about that. My mind is made up. I'm going to see it through to the very end. And I did. With this one, I it was more difficult because I was, it was this constant state of discovery. Like there was like, oh, I need to have her typing here. Oh, it's suddenly a book within a book. Oh, there's things I can't talk about that like come into play. And um and I kept like waffling sometimes and it got to the point where I got so lost that I had to, and I normally I do not do this at all, but go to my editor and my agent before it's finished. Normally when it's not until it's finished, then I'm like, here, I hope you like it. But in this case it was like, help me, I'm lost. Mm -hmm. And I did have to show them like the first 150 pages and be like, I honestly don't know. This might suck. I don't know. And um, they read it immediately, and to my great relief, and at that time, confusion, they're like, um, this is fantastic, just keep writing exactly what you're writing. And so I did, and then it wasn't until I finished that I'm like, yeah, they're right, this is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, good job, me. But you, you, you never, it's always when you're in the middle of it, in yeah. the thick of it, it's always so stressful and did you always see your way, since we can't discuss it, tantalizing for you, but did you always see your way to the end or did the end evolve as the book evolved? It was a little bit of both. I knew, um, gosh, I don't even know how many twists are in this thing. It's a Quite lot. Quite a few. There's a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I knew like, I think half of them were like the big ones. I'm like, okay, this, I know where I'm going to go because I need to know the ending in order right. to get the building blocks when you're writing. I need to know where I'm heading. Um, but along the way, I did discover some bonus twist, if you will, where places where I didn't quite intend it to be a twist. And then I got there. I was like, 
oh yeah, I could do this. And it was like, I was subconsciously like leading myself self there without even realizing it. And so it just sort of became like this domino effect of like twist after twist after twist. But so most of the time I do know exactly where I'm going. Like from the very start, it's like, In okay, most of your books, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. The only time I didn't know this where I was um, the last time I lied, which everyone seems to really love the twist at the end of that one. I did not know that. I was like, I was halfway through that book and I'm like, I don't know how this one's going to end. I really don't. <laughs> and then one night it just popped into my head and thank God, because I had no idea. But for that was the only one. All my other books, like I know like where they're going to lead to and like what that twist is. So Riley, you actually had a career before you were Riley Sager. Did that help you at all, the earlier books that you wrote? Um, yes and no. I made a lot of mistakes. Um, mistakes? Are you, just, are you sure that's a fair word? I, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I just don't want him to be too hard on himself. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm like my worst critic. Um, no, I, it, it was a very good learning experience. Like I learned how to write a novel and write one on deadline and, you know, come up with twist and ways of building suspense. But there was also just so much I didn't know yet. And that you, you, you can only pick up once you get a, several books under your belt. And there was stuff about the publishing industry that I didn't know. Well, who of us does? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the publishing industry, by the way, guys, it's crazy. And it, it, it really got so changed during COVID. So many things, um, unanticipated things happened and people who were used to working together suddenly are all working for their own homes. And um, it really has been a dramatic change, you know, for you as an author, certainly a huge change for us as booksellers, because basically booksellers are influencers. We may not be on TikTok, but nonetheless, we are influencers. And every time I write to you or, you know, we hold an event, that's an influencer situation. But it used to be that the publisher did most of that. And, you know, we just kind of were here. And now it's really the author and um, the bookseller that carry all of that. There's, there's, you know, I tell, I was telling Riley that every time we do this, I get a form. I mean, we've done, I think at last count, 1,051 events since April of 2020. Sometimes three a day. Today was two a day. I have two tomorrow, three another. And to get to 14, right, by Sunday has to be a lot. Some of them are Zoom and some of them are live. And that's all great. But basically, they're all up there for anybody to see. And they're all really the same. It's a conversation. It might be with me, might be, Riley might have had another author. He's going to be doing a conversation with another author next week. But it's not, you know, Riley sitting here reading you two chapters from his book. It just doesn't go that way. Every single time I get a question, what is the run of show? I mean, every single time. And I always write back and say, there isn't any because we're going to just make it up. But you would think, you know, by now that, that, that it wouldn't be hard to figure out what the runner show, at least here, is going to be, right? Yeah, it's, I've, I've done, like, in, in, in events when, it's, when it is just me, like, I'll just, last year there was an event, and I just, like, they had me, like, at a podium and stuff, and I'm like, I'm not, I, I don't do podiums. So, like, I just, like, just plop down on the steps. I'm like, okay, ask me stuff. Right. And... Like that was an hour. Like that, that was, was a good event. Yeah, it just that, that was Stuart Woods. Stuart Woods used to come to the store and he would sit down. And he'd say, "Hi, I'll take questions." <laughs> that was that was yeah. Stuart, right? And finally, you know, I would haul him back and say, "Stuart, we actually have to talk." Um, but <laughs> but it it isn't that interesting for you to come here and watch an author with their head down, you know, reading something. You can take the book home and read it. It's only really interesting. Now I'm going to say this that very occasionally, if there's an author with a remarkably distinctive voice that relates to the book, let's take James Lee Burke as an example. If you hear James Lee Burke read one of his books in that Louisiana, you know, Cajun Bayou voice of his, it can affect the way you read the book because you will hear it. 
there are British authors that, you know, if you hear them, yeah. it makes a difference. Now. So sometimes it's really great if an author reads just a little. So you get, but, you know, for an hour? Oh. Yeah, I, I did my poetry reading. That's, that's. <laughs> that was a recital. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Even better than that. <laughs> right. So um, moving on, since you are not writing a series, but rather um, various standalone novels. And the great thing about, about a standalone novel is that everybody in it is at risk, right? Everybody could go over the cliff if indeed the house goes over the cliff. Um, and so it's much more suspenseful. But there are great things about a series that, um, you know, for readers too, because then you get to, you know, re-meet, visit characters, play with the dog, you know, all, all kinds yeah. of great stuff. But that's not what you're doing currently. No, I, I would never. Like, the first three books under my real name were a series. And that wasn't you. It, it wasn't. Yeah, I it, it I felt like constrained. I was like, OK, this this is how the characters are. So I have to. And this I it, it just it, it didn't feel as organic to me as like writing like these fun standalones are. Or basically, he just makes shit up, right, every I single do. time. Yeah. And, yes. and that, But you can't do that in a series, it's true, because you do have to remember what you said about the characters and who they were and what age they were and were they, you know, what their profession was. And so it's just different. I love series, but I also really like stand. How many of you, any of you just only read standalones, for example? Is, don't ever want to read a series? Oh, look at that. Right. Okay. But more of you are happy to read series and standalones, probably. Okay. So what are you doing next, if you can give us even a preview? I can give you a slight preview. Um, it takes place in suburban New Jersey. And it's my... Well, it's technically not the first, because Home Before Dark had half. It's my first most male narrator um there's going to be some other voices as well too because i i gotta get my kick-ass female characters in this book too <laughs> and so like all of my books have passed the bechdel test and this one is going to as well so like it's don't worry um want to define the bechdel test um do you guys know who knows the bechdel test it's it's basically it's it's mostly used for movies but it's it's two women have a conversation that's not about a man and there's a shockingly number large number of like movies and books that fail this test like a crazy amount like you you would be surprised yeah okay i believe you so new jersey um male narrator bechtel test pass bechtel test yep that's all i can say that's so a, let's, that's a good let's, summation. That's it. So this is a hard question to ask during a writer's strike because, in point of fact, virtually every project um, has had to go on hold. My prediction is that AI is going to assume a larger role as a consequence of the writer's strike because AI is not on strike. And I don't think that's a good thing, but I think it's a probable thing. So what is it that you might be doing, if anything, in regard to film adaptation or television <laughs> and you can't say <laughs> there well i mean there yeah everything everything is on pause right um every like uh, stuff is still like everything's been optioned at some point most of those options have lapsed um there are two projects that are still like in development i don't know what the strike is going to do to to both of those once it once it ends and I mean, and there's other stuff that I will hopefully be working on maybe after the strike. After the strike's over, we're right. Trying to like there 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 might be some like non based on my book movie TV stuff that I get to do. Not Have you done book. script writing? No, I haven't. Are you excited about the prospect? I am very excited about the prospect. Yeah. I might suck at it, but at least I'm I, I do want to try it. Yeah. Right. So tell us how it's different for any of you who are interested. There's a real difference between not fiction, not or novel writing and script writing. Most of it having to do with one is mostly dialogue and the other has a lot of other stuff. Well, yeah. And you, you can't 
like a, a full book can't turn into a movie. Like there are subplots you need. You need to streamline everything for the movie, and it's it's just a whole different beast. Like I was asked when um, the house across the lake, which is one of the projects that is in development or at least was until the writer strike happened. Like I had a lot of meetings about that and I was asked multiple times, like, are you interested in writing the script? And I'm like, no, because I don't know how to do it. Like I wouldn't know how to do it based on one of my books. I would know how to do an original screenplay or even possibly based on a book by someone else because right. I don't have that sentimental attachment to certain parts where I can just be like, oh, this this character, pff, gone. <laughs> like, just be ruthless about it. Because you need to be, like, an, yeah. someone writing an adaptation needs to be ruthless in terms of just everything. And I did read a screenplay to one of my books, and I was surprised by what was left out. And yeah. what the, I was... <laughs> That's all I'll say, yeah. Got it. So um, we are coming to the question part, but Patrick, do you have questions from the audience other than what was that book on the table? <laughs> um, no, not really. Let's see. Will you be doing a physical book tour? If so, will you be coming to Southeast Florida? Um, this is my physical book tour. And no, Actually, it's starting to tonight. For yes, those of you who are not aware, this is... Right. So, but no Florida. No Florida. Okay. And the other question is, do your friends and family, are they starting to call you Riley now? Not really. I mean, I, I do have some writer friends who, like, they obviously know my real name. <laughs> and they'll just, like, just be like, call me Riley. And, and <laughs> I'm like, you can call me Todd. Like, it's... it's, it's... I thought I'd... Yeah. Anybody have questions? Hi, Riley. Hi. I'm actually from New Jersey. So, yeah. yeah New, New Jersey. Uh, yeah, New Jersey. Um, okay. I have one fun question. Okay. And then one actual question. So the first one is, what's your favorite Taylor Swift album? Because I'm a big Swifty. And then, is there any authors you look up to or get inspiration from? Um, it used to be 1989. <laughs> uh, it's probably folklore now. Just because we we all needed that album and yes. we did not know we needed that album. And then it just, we were at our lowest point and she was like, here. And it was glorious. Um, who do I look up to and respect? No one. No. <laughs> no, I mean, there there are a lot. Um, an author that I, I just absolutely love, I think she can write so well, is, is Megan Abbott, if you've ever read her. Like, Dare Me. was just her? She, yeah. Dare Me is like the book I recommend, like, I think the most to people. It's such a great book. Cheerleader Noir. That's all you need to know. Wait, let me put in a pitch for Beware the Woman, because Megan Evans' Beware the Woman that she signed here a week ago Sunday is, in fact, a gothic. And it has some of the same features. They're isolated in a cottage on the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, and there's family secrets, and there's this young pregnant bride who, and you know what, the two questions, and I think since this is really important questions to think about that that book asks are one, do you really know the person you married? And two, what does the obligation of a parent, of a child to a parent, if there are other obligations that that child has, like, for example, a spouse. Who gets the greater loyalty, the wife or the parent? These are really tough questions. Um, she does a great job with it. So if you haven't read Megan, that's the book I would actually recommend yeah, for this audience. She's really good. Um, other, like, I love Megan Miranda. Um, yeah, Megan Miranda fan. Um, just, he, he, well, probably like if you've never read Clay McLeod Chapman, he's so good. He's so scary. Um, Whisper Down the Lane is such a great book. It's one of my favorite books of like the past five years. So, um, yeah, those are just three. How about Grady yeah. Hendrix? Do you like his horror? How to Sell a Haunted House. So good. That one, like I read that in a day and it went to bonkers places. I'm going to sell you a book. I'm going to sell... Riley, a book by Jason Recollect called Hidden Pictures. Mm -hmm. Did you read it? Yes, it's very good. Oh, 
Not only is it a great book, but one of the characters' entire dialogue is in drawings. The character does not speak, and as the drawings progress, so the character story is revealed. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. It's, it's a very, yeah, that's another book that, like, I have, like, because sometimes friends will, like, just be like, so any good books? What should I read? And then I say, like, me? And then they're like, no, not you. And so, like, that's a, one where I just, that's kind of a go-to, too. Where it's just, it like, really is. It just came out in paper. Like, Hidden really Pictures good. just came out in paperback, and it's just, it's so good, right? All right, another question. That's a great question. Thank you. I see. Hi. Hi, Grace. Um, kind of easy, quick question, but Rebecca's Manderley or Wuthering Heights? <sighs> Manderley. Sorry. <laughs> the Brontes are Wuthering or... Heights. Uh, what tropes are on your writing bucket list? Oh gosh, um, I've I'll never do this, or I I might do it. Like I love Jaws, and so I would love to write. There is a thing with lots of teeth under the water eating swimmers. Like I would love to do that, but the thing is, like I would humiliate myself, and so like I I I did an interview like last week and they asked me a similar question i said like a jaws type thing i'm like but i'd never do it and i'm like well maybe I'm like if i never if like i never need any money whatsoever again <laughs> i don't need to worry about like my reputation or sales or anything and i'm like so if you ever see me write like a jaws type book just know that i'm like financially secure because that's that's the only way I think it's gonna happen. Because it it could it could be disastrous. Um, on. I don't know if it's on. Okay. Um, I don't really know. I can't really think of like a book related question, sadly. But I do have a Taylor Swift one. I take I take those. <laughs> yep. Um, if you got to choose which surprise song you got, and not using the ones that you did get, what would you choose? Well, the surprise songs I got were Snow on the Beach and um, Our Song, which Our Song was awesome. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't, I Getaway Car would be one. And probably, see it's hard because she sang so many songs like in the regular like lineup of the thing. Um, a really good one um see i i can't getaway car that's the only one i can think of but i will i will fun story when i saw the reputation tour it was metlife stadium it was pouring down rain like the whole start to finish pouring down rain and when it came time for the secret song she said like by the way th this is a new costume on this tour so you could say that I'm dancing in the rain in my best dress. And then she sang Fearless, and it was amazing. <laughs> okay, But we digress. Yes. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, so you're very well known for the standalone books in their own universe, own characters. Would you ever consider for future projects elements, locations, characters from one standalone book crossing over into another? I mean, there have been some Easter eggs. Like, there were some Easter eggs in the house across the lake to previous books. Um, I don't think I would ever, like, have crossover characters, per se, but maybe some mentions. Um, I did attempt a crossover, like, once. Like, the the reporter in Final Girls, Jonah Thompson, I think that was his name. Like, guys, once I write a book... It's just phew. like it's it's crazy when I'm writing the book. I will remember everything like down to like page numbers. Like when I'm doing edits, my editor will be like, "You need to mention this," and I'll be like, "I did on page 135." And then like once the book is published, I remember nothing. So I think his name was Jonah Thompson. I was gonna have him appear in a later book, but it just it just felt like shoehorned in and didn't feel organic. But that's about like all I would do. Like I I. I like creating new 
things every time. Like, you know, Hope's End was a really cool place to create and a really cool world to play around in. Just like the lake in the house across the lake was a really cool place. So I like coming up with really neat atmospheric locations and new sets of characters to inhabit them. Right. That's called world building, which is what science fiction and fantasy writers do so well. You have to really love it. Hi, Riley. Um, are there any Easter eggs in the only one left? I know I noticed a couple on the house across the lake, but are there any in this one? No. Did I? No. <laughs> Maybe. Let's just say that. No, I, I was thinking of doing one, but I don't think there are. Because it's 1983, there's more references to... Now, because it's sort of like chronologically, it's like the first thing to happen here so maybe i will do in later books references to the hope family massacre or something which i wish i'd had the like the planning and the foresight like to have planted this like you know have someone mention it like in home before dark and then you don't see it until like three books later but yeah i don't plan that far ahead anything else well, somebody online would like to know, do you like uh, Simone St. James? I do. I love Simone St. James. Oh. Aunt Patrick, there, there was Bethany. the hand that went up way back there. Okay. Let's make yeah. that the last question. In fact, I actually read Simone St. James' upcoming book, and it's good. Hi. Hello. Do you ever um, creep yourself out when you're writing books? Um, I, well, this is a question for all of you. Like, do you think my books are scary? Because I don't. Okay. Because like some people, oh, you do? But I, I, so I don't really, the only time I scared myself really was like writing Home Before Dark. And that was more because I was writing about a creepy house when I just moved into a house. And my house is, my house is not creepy. It did have bats in the attic though, which was not fun. But when you when you are in a new place and you're not accustomed to its quirks yet, like you'll hear things and just be like, what was that? And so because my deadline was so tight, like there would be times when it'd be like two in the morning and I'd be like in my dim office, like writing, 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 and I'd hear something and be like, what was <laughs> And it was just it so I don't think it was if my my house was scaring me and not me. It's a long answer to, yeah. Uh, so the way you've been describing um, this book, it seems similar to another book that we read called Verity by Colleen Hoover. Have you read that? And do you kind of see any similarities in the story? I haven't read Verity. Okay. Is it similar? <laughs> <I don't... laughs> okay. We're, we're excited in the way that you've been explaining it because we really like that book. It's one of the few psychological horror movies that was kind of creepy and scary. So I should read, read that one. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. I I haven't read Colleen Hoover. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Hi, Riley. Hi. Firstly, I agree you should read Verity, 100%. Okay. Secondly, I'm just curious, what are you reading right now? Right now, I am reading The Wager by David Grant on audio. And I will be reading on the plane tomorrow, Zero Days by Ruth Ware. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming this evening. Let's give Riley a round of applause. Thank you. And now I'm going to give you back yes. your book. And we will move to, so John or who's up there? Can you tell me how many numbers we gave out? 101? All right. So that means there are 101 people in here who bought a book. And therefore, there is a ticket inside the book. So the book I'm going to give away that has confused everybody. Um, I did a talk this afternoon. Ian K. Smith is a best-selling doctor of all kinds of interesting health and diet books, but he loves writing fiction. He's been on The View, and he's been a big television personality, and his books are set in Chicago, and they're really terrific. 
So um, we're going to give away a copy of this third book with the Chicago detective Ash Kane, and it's appropriate for Juneteenth for reasons that you will see. So Riley, pick a number between one and 100. See, I'm putting all the blame on Riley. Isn't this is uh, great. Yeah. Right, okay, one and I'll, 101. I will do my age. Don't tell anyone, guys. 49. <gasps> 49. Now you have to be here to win it. So if there's no 49 in the room, we'll get another number. Because that happens sometimes. Nobody has a 49? You all looked at your tickets? I revealed my age for nothing. <laughs> but can we trust him? Can we really believe that 49 is right? All right, try a different one. Okay, we'll do we'll, 48, and then we'll just go down. Ah, is that a, is that a hand back there? All right, when you get to the signing thing, then come and claim the book. 49, there is a 49 back there? Oh, oh there okay. was. Oh, sorry, 48. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bummer. Right, all right. So there really was a 49. I love it. All right, so this is the tricky part with so many people here. Um, if you could, I think it would be safer if the first... 30 people stay here and the rest of you might want to just sort of wander outside a little bit. We need to have you fold up the chairs and push them